I like when she says that. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to PD Active's sixth virtual speaker forum. My name is Todd Morish, and I will be your host and moderator this morning with assistance from Sue Stein Black, whom you see there on your screen. We hope you're all staying safe and healthy and cool and cautiously enjoying a return to normalcy. Before I introduce our speaker, a little bit of housekeeping from our end. First, we always like to cross promote our many PD Active programs besides PD Active's renowned support groups. We also offer many other classes <clears throat> and programs for people with Parkinson's and their caregivers and loved ones. There's Tai Chi and yoga and Pilates and meditation. And there's voice and singing and boxing and dance and much more. If you have tried one or more of these, we ask you to please tag a friend or a family member to join you in your next session. Please check out the calendar link on the brand new pdactive.org website. It's right there on the homepage. You just need to scroll down a little bit below the fold. And we will paste that URL into the Zoom chat tool now. Um, in fact, I'm asking Adam Mizok to help us with that as he comes in for, as an attendee. So pay attention to your chat window for any information from us to you. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Right now, you are all on mute. We have a large group of attendees today, so this will help make for a fluid presentation without a lot of distractions. Additionally, if you are new to Zoom's webinar format, you will not see other attendees in your Zoom window, not their pictures, at least. Only Dr. Katz and myself, along with Sue. Um, so don't be distraught about that. One important note, this webinar is being recorded, as I mentioned at the top. Um, and we will post the recording to our PD Active YouTube channel in the next few days, um, maybe even sooner than a few days. So see the chat window now for that URL that Adam will paste in for us when he can. And thank you, by the way, to Dr. Katz for allowing us to record it. Um, you may submit, submit questions when you have them using Zoom's Q&A feature there in your Zoom tool tray on the bottom of your screen. We have reserved Q&A time at the end of the presentation to pose those questions to Dr. Katz. Sue and I will use the Zoom chat feature, as I mentioned a moment ago, to relay information to you regarding the presentation, but we prefer you use the Q&A tool uh, for questions to the doctor. So throughout the doctor's presentation, we will present you with a handful of poll questions, which will pop up on your Zoom screens. Please answer these as quickly as you can so the doctor may respond to these <clears throat> in the flow of her presentation. If you prefer not to answer the questions, that's just fine. Merely close the windows when they pop up. We'll start with a simple one right now, if I can do that as I'm as I'm talking. So I've just launched one, which is just an idea, it gives the doctor an idea of who our audience is today. So if you wouldn't mind filling, clicking on uh, the relevant response there, that would be terrific. Um, if for any reason Dr. Katz or I get disconnected from this webinar, which I doubt it hasn't happened to us yet, so um, then please be patient and do not disconnect or leave the meeting for a few minutes as we try to get reconnected. It is possible that Sue may take over as host if I'm disconnected, but again, this hasn't happened yet. So finally, PD Active depends on donations to bring events like this to our members free of charge. And we, remember, we remain extremely grateful to you for your contributions. If you have not yet had a chance to make the suggested registration donation of $10 for this forum, we will paste that link into the chat feature now also. Okay, here we go. Dr. Maya Katz is a movement disorders uh, neurologist at Stanford Health Center. She is also a clinical associate professor of neurology at Stanford University School of Medicine. While Dr. Katz has specialized in deep brain stimulation or DBS and other advanced treatment approaches, her main clinical and research focus is optimizing the delivery and accessibility of palliative care for people with Parkinson's disease and related disorders. Dr. Katz is dedicated to taking a comprehensive approach to well being and optimizing quality of life for patients and their families. Here uh, is a link to her bio on the Stanford website. Adam can paste that in now. So Dr. Katz, welcome and thank you very much for taking the time out of your Saturday to join us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll hand the figurative mic over to you now and do feel free to expand on that bio vis-a-vis uh, -vis palliative care as much as you like or dive right into your presentation. But thank you very much. And you can see by the poll here that we've got mostly PWPs as we call ourselves, people with Parkinson's, but also a few caregivers. So 
that gives you an idea of whom we are talking to today. That's great. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to join this group. I really love PD Active and I send a lot of my patients and families that I care for to this group. So it's really um, wonderful to be able to be uh, just, you know, just contributing and being a part of it. So yeah, thank you for completing the poll. It's nice for me to see who's in the audience. <clears throat> All right, so please go ahead as, uh, and as I'm talking, you know, if anything comes up, any questions, please go ahead and do, um, add them to the chat so that we can, I can hopefully address them later. So we're going to, uh, go through the talk for about an hour and then we're gonna have a little bio break and then come back and then do some questions just so everyone kind of gets a sense of what the time frame is. Perfect, yeah, thank you for laying out that landscape. <laughs> Great. So yeah, so really wanted to talk about, part, about palliative care and how that really is just a natural, um, uh, really uh, fantastic way to take care of anyone who's dealing with something serious, whether it's Parkinson's disease or anything else, and how palliative care is a total health approach. And just really trying to um, show that to people and, and help um, really expose people to the specialty. So the main objectives, we're gonna talk about the concepts of palliative care and how really they're just the concepts of, of total health. I'm gonna talk about some wellness strategies from the palliative care perspective and how you can incorporate that into your life immediately. And then also just talking a little bit about how you can get the most out of your uh, medical visits with um, just some communication strategies that can help you focus on, total, on your total health. So I just wanted to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, some of the myths about palliative care. I think once someone hears from their doctor, oh, I, you know, it might be a good idea, you know, for you to talk to the palliative care folks. A lot of people think, oh, well, are you throwing in the towel? <laughs> um, so, and actually palliative care is the total opposite of that. So um, palliative care, I just, you know, focusing on the World Health Organization definition of palliative care. So it's an approach that improves quality of life, really focuses on quality. And it's, focuses on intensive symptom management, whether that's pain or any other distressing symptoms. We don't let them go until they're um, as reduced or as gone as possible. And we focus not only on the physical health of people because we're not just biological buttons, we're also spiritual, social, and psychological beings. And so all of those aspects need are affected by serious illness and then are improved if we can, uh, you know, quality of life is improved if we can uh, improve health in these areas. And also palliative care helps with um, coping. That's really important, not only um, for families, but for people affected by anything serious, there's just a natural adjustment reaction that we as humans go through and we need help building coping skills and resilience. And palliative care is applicable early in the course of illness in conjunction with other therapies. I really think it should be given to people at day one. Mm -hmm. um, and the concept of total, of palliative care really stems from this concept of total health. And so total health is really just looking at um, the fact that if we just look at humans as physical beings and biological buttons, we're really shortchanging us because we're so much more, right? And so um, in order for us to really feel healthy, we need to be able to address all of the aspects of health that makes us human. Um, this concept was developed by Dr. Cicely Saunders in the 1960s, actually. So palliative care is a, you know, a fairly, um, you know, there, uh, there's been decades of experience. It's not a new field. And she was actually knighted by the queen uh, for her work uh, developing palliative care. Uh, she uh, is, uh, started out as a nurse, became a social worker, and then went to medical school in her 30s, uh, back in the 1960s, which is, you know, made her quite a pioneer in her day. So um, she really kind of brought this idea together. And, you know, just kind of looking at the different aspects of Parkinson's and the different aspects of health that it affects, 
we know that motor symptoms are just the tip of the iceberg in Parkinson's. And so, and we know that people with Parkinson's often the non-motor symptoms are under addressed, under treated, under recognized. Most people um, uh, have eight, about eight non-motor symptoms that they're dealing with. And most of them just from research we know are not addressed in a typical uh, neurologist visit. And so if they're not talked about, they're not going to be treated. Mm -hmm. And then social health, you know, really when anyone's dealing with something serious, it changes family dynamics. There can be loss of autonomy. Whenever most people, there's a natural instinct to withdraw when they get some kind of serious or difficult news or they're in a difficult situation. And um, that isolation is really um, bad for uh, our health and our social health. And so what we need to do instead of withdrawing is we need to connect. We need to practice opposite action <laughs> of what our brain tells us to do. Mm -hmm. And there's also just difficulty accessing care. There's um, a shortage of movement disorder specialists, movement disorder, uh, Parkinson's are neurologically specialized physical therapists, there's just a shortage of um, <clears throat> difficulty accessing care. Most of the care, as you know, are gonna be in academic centers or in um, cities. And so telemedicine has really helped that significantly, but um, I do, this does um, lead to just a sense of isolation for people if they can't access the care. Spiritual health is super important. So for, you know, for a lot of people, when they, you know, when you're given anything serious, any kind of serious news about your health, it makes you question kind of existential, have existential questions. Mm -hmm. And in, so spiritual health is really, really important. Uh, one question that's been shown to accurately measure spiritual health is, are you at peace? For people who are, who have a greater amount of spiritual health, their overall physical health is better too. They do better no matter what they're dealing with. So we, we know that that is, it's really critical. And it seems it's, it's kind of, you know, obvious once you say it, right? Of course we need that right. kind of help. And safe to say that spiritual goes beyond just the religious or faith-based aspects and, go, and expands into, you know, what keeps you at peace. Exactly, exactly. And um, a lot of it is, um, so it's the uh, ideas of se being able to um, have self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, being uh, and um, being able to feel connected. And we'll talk a little bit about connection. Mm -hmm. I'm not a chaplain myself. And so um, when I was at UCSF, I worked a lot with a chaplain who uh, did a lot of these talks with me and could explain much more about what spiritual health is. But yes, it's not, um, it's more about uh, your connection to your, the greater and whatever that means to you. Yeah, sure. Planning, um, preparing for the future. Um, is really important for people and they're uh, just being able to have some kind of anticipatory guidance and whatever is important for every person that's different. And so um, palliative care offers people that uh, anticipatory guidance and helping them plan and prepare for the future so that they have peace of mind now. And palliative care, we also focus on care partner health. You know, serious, any kind of serious health issue doesn't just affect the person with the health issue, it affects the whole family. And so uh, we need to keep the, the family healthy. No one's an island, right? And so I just like this, keep calm and place your oxygen mask on first. And so um, I often, I often uh, speak with care partners about, you know, if you gotta put your oxygen on mask, then you can help someone else. And so, um, regular breaks, being able to, everyone needs to recharge, even the like SEAL Team 6 of caregivers. <laughs> yeah, that's good, I like that. I like every this Every single person, every single person will burn out, even, even the SEAL Team 6 caregiver, we all need to recharge. So it's super important to remember that we're all just human. So this idea of connection is protection is really big in palliative care. So this isn't just about you know, we talked about connection to the greater, but also connection to the self, what's important to you, what are your values, what are your um, authentic goals and uh, what brings you joy personally, that kind of connection to the self is really important for health. 
connection to your family, uh, being able to be uh, in a space where your concerns are validated, uh, where they're acknowledged and where you feel support and encouragement and feeling heard, super important in your family and in your community, and then connection to nature and then connection to the greater, whatever that means. So mm -hmm. that's that's the different levels of connection that we really are so important to health and that we focus on in palliative care and helping with, um, with the adjustment reaction. Yeah, and yet it can be hard, right, to, to for folks, especially the newly diagnosed, to sort of overcome that sense of inertia that might be caused by self-doubt or guilt or, you know, worry and anxiety. It can be hard to break that inertia and go out and get connected, whether it's with nature or with friends or with family, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's, that's, uh, there's so many different layers to why that might be, mm -hmm. right? So, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes when we feel that way, um, it's because we're, for, for some people, the adjustment reaction turns into depression. Yeah. So right. there's a reactive depression that can happen um, when people are facing something difficult. Yeah. 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 And so that, that becomes its own beast that needs treatment, that needs a mm -hmm. different kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. And I like to say Parkinson's kind of takes away the boots. So it's not the kind of depression where you can sort of pick yourself up by your bootstraps and just keep going. <laughs> if you don't have the boots, you can't pick yourself up by the bootstraps. What are the yeah. boots? The boots are the coping molecules that uh, basically are in our brains. And we know, so serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Those are the three people usually hear um, about serotonin being important. But dopamine, norepinephrine is also important in our ability to feel peace, calm, joy, be able to enjoy anything. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I like to say it's not magic up there. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. computer. <laughs> And so we need certain chemicals to make us feel a certain way so that we can pick ourselves up by the bootstraps. And so, so you know, the, that's why really reactive depression needs, needs the boots. And so needs, needs to really have, you know, fortunately we do have ways to give people back these chemicals. And so, you know, talking with your doctor about that is really important. And then there's just sort of the general, um, in the adjustment reaction realm, you know, um, so, Feelings of um, isolation, uh, loss, um, guilt, even these are the difficult emotions that everyone has when they're dealing with something difficult. No mm -hmm. one is immune to that. And so those we can't give people enough Zoloft to, you know, we don't want to give people enough Zoloft to like numb normal emotions. <laughs> We're right. not trying to like make people numb. So that's not, that's, you know, that that's not the goal. So really working on some of those difficult emotions to help us cope, to help us feel um, like we have our place again in the world, though there are actually strategies for that. Um, and so the, there are certain uh, therapists, for, for example, I work with some of them um, and I'd, I'd, have, I'd be happy to, give, maybe I can put the name in, in the chat of one that I refer a lot of people to, and they specialize in helping people cope and build resiliency. Um, and there's also an ongoing course taught by the chaplain I worked with at UCSF mm -hmm. online uh, for people with Parkinson's and then <clears throat> their care partners, a separate course on coping and resiliency. So these are absolutely skills that you can learn and bring into your life. And we'll, we'll actually be talking about some of them today that I've learned from the chaplain that I can share with you. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, I mean, by the time we get to Q&A session, maybe if you have a, a spare minute to to put those into the chat, that would be terrific. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, these these difficult emotions, they that are so normal, they don't wind up helping us get better, right? Mm -hmm. They hurt us, they hurt our, our so, psychosocial and spiritual health, and so they make us sicker. And so we need to learn to counteract them, and we need to learn to, um, con to reconnect and, mm -hmm. and all those different levels so that we have that kind of total health that we're looking for. Um, so what are we looking at here in A versus B? <laughs> so <laughs> basically, yeah, basically what this shows is that we're wired, essentially we're wired to connect. So this is the different network of the brain when individuals are, for example, you know, asked in a specific study, they're asked to, um, they're shown different pictures um, that are supposed to kind of bring out compassion. And so mm -hmm. these are the different areas that are, um, 
that are activated by the brain. And so basically shows that we're wired essentially to connect. We're meant to connect. We're not meant to be um, withdrawn and isolated. Sure. And so we're not healthy if, if, if we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this kind of just wanted to talk about, this is my first um, slide that talks about some of the wellness strategies that, uh, that we teach in palliative care and that you know, some of these are the ones that are focused on by, um, by the coping strategies if you wanted to explore more. For example, the online course taught at UCSF on this topic. So mindfulness is, is really important. I know it has a, uh, it's a certain trendiness to mindfulness that almost kind of um, might take away its original meaning. But so mindfulness really uh, means to pay attention and so to really control your focus and um, to do it in a calm way. That's basically what mindfulness is. And so this is a quote by John Kabat-Zinn who created mindfulness-based stress reduction. So um, you can't stop the wave, but you can learn to surf. What's right? his name, Dr. Katz? Uh, it's John Kabat-Zinn. I think I might have him. He's right here in the center. Yeah. So he's right. the person that developed mindfulness based uh, stress, stress reduction about mindfulness basically to um, the Western world. He's a biochemist and he showed that mindfulness reduces pain. That was what he first used it for. Um, and so that you can actually buy this on Amazon mindfulness uh, meditation for pain relief and it'll teach you how to practice mindfulness to reduce pain. And so um, <clears throat> I, uh, I appreciate the quote because we can't stop the waves of life, right? But we can learn to we can learn to manage them and to feel balanced through them. And so these are some of the uh, mindfulness uh, resources that I I recommend. So Headspace you may have heard of is pretty popular. It's a um, it's an app that you can buy. It's about ten dollars a, a month. And uh, I recommend that really everyone on this call get Headspace and complete the beginner one series of meditation. It's only about, there are three to five minute meditations and, and you do one a day. So, and, uh, so I really recommend that everyone just uh, go ahead and make that something that you, that you wanna do for the next 10 days. Yeah, I, I'm an active Headspace user and I can testify to its helpfulness. Yeah, yeah. And then um, mindfulness on the go just has uh, simple meditation practices that you can do um, every day. And so I think that's kind of a nice, simple way to, I thought that book was helpful. And then I, I recommend that everyone get a book called How to Relax by Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, some of you may have heard of Thich Nhat Hanh before or read his works before. He's a Buddhist um, poet. And so he writes these really simple books. And so one of them um, is how to relax. And I think it's an important um, teaching about uh, mindfulness and how to stay alert and uh, calm at the same time. So if, I would say out of these two things, if you have to pick, I would say how to the how to relax book and the headspace. If <laughs> everyone could just finish beginner one series, I think you'll really appreciate it. <laughs> Good. Okay. Sit not Hans, just a simple smiling is mouth yoga. So I do just recommend, I know it's, it seems kind of corny, just put a smile on it. <laughs> but it's, it's actually a really powerful way to tell your brain that things are okay. <laughs> I'm, you know, fight or flight can come down. And, um, and it just brings you to the present moment, basically, because you have to really focus on activating those muscles. And so I, I, I think it's just, it's just a kind of a, an amusing statement, but also a very true statement and, an, and kind of an, an easy way to bring some joy into your life. So mm -hmm. smiling is mouth yoga, just something to remember. I like that. So I just want to remind people for wellness strategies, it's really um, cognitive leisure activities is really important, you know, especially as people get older and they retire, you know, if they're retired and they're not really doing things that are cognitively active, people get really focused on doing physical activities, but don't forget about the cognitive activities. So, um, you know, a lot of people have word finding issues. So if you do crossword puzzles, you're gonna strengthen that muscle in the brain. 
you know, the word remembering muscle. Mm -hmm. So the more you do things in the brain, the more the networks get stronger, the more likely you can access it when you need it. Jigsaw puzzles are a great, are a great way to practice what's called your visual spatial uh, function, cognitive function, you know, that is important for driving and other tasks. So all of these little types of leisure activities that you can do are actually really important. And for, for those people who work, actually having kind of separate cognitive leisure activities is also important to exercise your brain so that it's not just in the setting of um, kind of uh, forced cogn cog cognitive activities. And can you tell me here that my addiction to words with friends is now validated then with uh, as a cognitive tool? Yes. Good. Just I'll depends tell, if you're I'll skipping meals. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> no, it's not that bad yet. <laughs> or not sleeping well because of it, then it might be an addiction. But otherwise, I think it's a good idea. Okay, good. Phew. I'll tell my wife. Yeah. And then people ask me about nutrition and wellness strategies. So the main the main recommendations for nutrition is to try to eat an organic diet. That's because the pesticides that we eat every day get uh, cause damage to the brain. And they, I, they actually cause damage to the part of the brain affected by Parkinson's. And so really trying to minimize any toxicity to the brain is super, super important. Really for your for care partners, just you know to keep the brain healthy and then for people affected with Parkinson's. Um, organic um, uh, milk uh, is also to be avoided or reduced as much as possible in general, try, trying to reduce dairy um, as much as possible because it accumulates pesticides. So if you think about the cows, they're eating the grass on their organic farm that's right next door to the non-organic farm. So they're mm -hmm. eating the pesticides and then it, it, it accumulates in dairy. So, you know, obviously, everything in moderation, even moderation. So if you like some cheese every now and then, that's the spiritual health that's really important. <laughs> you don't need to cut like everything out. Cheese, so, if cheese is your higher power, then relent. Yeah, then it's okay, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of chocolate is always good for you, is what I say. Um, and I guess unless you're allergic to chocolate, it's not good for you. Um, and then probiotics is very important. So we know that um, the, in the gut of people with Parkinson's, we get bacteria that uh, shouldn't be there. And now we know that several of those bacteria are, are actually eating dopamine. Oh. And so that's why people get a lot of dose failures and early wearing off is because the bacteria in the gut eats dopamine. And so they're, it's eating the medicine. And what, are there specific food types that will contribute to that bacteria that's eating our dopamine? I, this is kind of news to me, so I, we don't have to dive too deep into the nutritional aspect here, but. I don't know if that's, I don't know if those two, they're, they're two different bacteria and I don't know if they're found in specific foods or not. Um, this was just a recent discovery. So probably why I don't know about it. Okay. <clears throat> so it was just discovered about a year ago. Hmm. Um, so, what we do know is that you can try, you can replace the bad bacteria with good bacteria, and there's different ways of doing it. Um, there are one thing that you can do is just eat probiotics, eat good bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's probiotics you can buy. There's probiotics you can eat, like in kimchi or sauerkraut or um, kefir. There's different like activia yogurts that have it. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know the best way to replace the gut microbiome. Uh, you know, should it, is it this bacteria? Is it that my, uh, probiotic that's still being studied? So we don't know. Mm -hmm. And some people actually, if they have um, a lot of the wrong bacteria, they'll get a lot of abdominal cramping and bloating. And so for those people, they may actually have something called the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth mm -hmm. or SIBO. And so they need, they need antibiotics to actually basically get rid of all the gut bacteria. Hmm. And then they can eat the good probiotics to replenish. So there's different levels of kind of getting in the good bacteria. And it's very much an area of study, which is why, you know, you haven't heard of it before. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's been, those two bacteria have been identified. And then scientists, uh, there's a group at UCSF that are working on creating um, an antibody against those two bacteria. So I think in the future, right. people will just 
be immunized against those two bacteria. So that, that's that's what's being worked on right now. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> the Mediterranean diet is um, has been shown to be the best diet for uh, for brain health. So people that primarily eat the Mediterranean diet live longer. They get uh, they have a lower risk of developing dementia. And actually, older adults who eat primarily this diet, they actually have larger brain volumes. So they have more brain. So uh, basically, in this diet, you're going to really focus on um, whole grains, uh, very little, any you know, simple processed um, carbohydrates like white bread, uh, white flour should not be um, included. And then they, they eat a lot of olives, olive oil, fish, um, eggs, chicken, very little red meat, if any, like one or one, once or twice a month. Mm. So that's the, that's the Mediterranean diet. And then I have a caution for any kind of fried or processed foods, non-organic dairy or organic dairy. I talked about any kind of simple carbs, animal meats and fats, and then limiting alcoholic beverages. That does not mean no alcoholic beverages actually uh, for brain and heart health. Uh, one glass of wine a night is probably good for you. So that's actually been shown for, uh, it reduces stroke risk. So it's not, you don't have to completely cut out alcohol. Obviously, depending on your medications and your specific situation, mm -hmm. you know, may be different. But certainly making sure that it's limited. And then just focusing on exercise. And I think, you know, for people involved in PD active, they tend to be more active. And so, but, um, but just to kind of summarize that the goal is about a, at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to high intensity exercise. And high intensity aerobic activity is the only thing that's been shown to delay Parkinson's progression. Moderate intensity doesn't work. What is, how do you define high intensity aerobic? So high intensity has to do with your maximal heart rate. So basically um, you wanna reach 85% of your maximal heart rate. For someone who's in their 60s, that's about 120 to 125 is the maximal heart rate. Mm -hmm. And I'll put in a link, you can calculate your maximal heart rate based, it's based on your age. Right. Of course, if you have any specific heart conditions, any type of shortness of breath, anything like that, you wanna make sure to talk to your doctor, you may have, um, limitations based on your on, on what's required for your health. But for the study that showed delayed progression, it was two hours a week for people reaching their maximum heart rate, 85% of their maximal heart rate. And it doesn't matter what you do, you just have to reach the heart rate goal. That kind of challenge actually changes the brain and it makes it more efficient in the way that it, it, um, it uses dopamine. So you need half the dopamine to get the, to get the same effect basically. So the more high intensity aerobics you do, the more you actually change the brain. And then for balance, Tai Chi, and I know PD Active has a Tai Chi class, which is fantastic. I send a lot of people to it. And so Tai Chi has been shown to be the best for balance in Parkinson's. And so it really, it increases in Parkinson's, people start to lose their awareness of their body in space. Of course, that's super important for balance, right? If you don't know where your trunk is in space and your neck is in space, mm -hmm then you're not going to be able to adjust to different uh, kind of forced, you know, movements that we all have rock as the world rocks around, right? We're spinning actually very fast in the universe. That's true. We're actually spinning at hundreds of millions of miles per hour. We have a vestibular system that's so sensitive that only tells us when we're making changes in velocity, accelerations or decelerations. That's why we feel like we're still in a car, right? That's like moving very fast. So we're constantly swaying and have to and having to adjust to the sway. We don't even realize that our brain is doing it because our brain knows where we are in space. So that knowledge is super important and that's what Tai Chi is likely giving back to us. So I do encourage everyone to do Tai Chi if possible. It, it was shown to be uh, superior to just uh, to physical therapy and helping. Um, with balance. And then also I really want to stress something called forced exercise. So basically um, in general, and then also people with Parkinson's uh, underestimate how fast um, 
they can go. I think probably people in general underestimate how fast they can go, but uh, this has just been studied in people with Parkinson's. So if you if you basically have someone with Parkinson's on a, on a um, stationary bike, they can go a certain speed. But if you put a physical therapist in front of the tandem bike, they meet the speed of the physical therapist. And then if you have them, if you have that kind of forced exercise for a couple of hours a week, after about, a, after the study was eight weeks, afterwards, the person with Parkinson's goes as fast as the physical therapist on their own and their balance is better and their cognition is better. So you're, create, you're creating a lot of healthy networks in the brain when you force yourself to go faster than you think you can. Mm. So there's different. Yeah, so tandem biking is a, is a way to do forced exercise. And then there's different types of equipment that do forced exercise as well. The TheraCycle has forced exercise. Um, I guess the treadmill, I guess I guess the treadmill might be considered forced exercise, right? Sure, sure, sure. You, 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 you just use the throttle to go a little bit faster, a little bit faster. Right, right. And if you're doing a stationary bike, you can just turn up the, um, the resistance on the bike. Mm -hmm. Right. So make yourself go faster and you can, you can use different settings to do that. So just keep in mind, you can probably go faster than you think you can <laughs> you can reach that max, that 85% maximal heart rate. Mm -hmm. And then something else that's really, really healthy is called dual tasks. So it's sort of the idea of, oh, it's tough to chew gum and walk at the same time, right? There's that saying, it is tough to do two things at the same time, but it's very good for the brain if you do. So a lot of the times physical therapists working with people with Parkinson's are gonna focus on dual tasks because it's so good for the brain. Mm -hmm. a very simple dual task that you can do with, with any partner that has been shown to, re, to improve balance and cognition in Parkinson's. When you're, if you just take a walk with a partner and basically every step you can say a word and then your partner says a word that starts with the last letter of the word you just said. So for example, I could say, you know, I can say duck and then my partner would say king and then I would say goat. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that very simple dual task because you're walking and thinking of a word mm -hmm. improves cognition and balance significantly. So that's an example of a dual task. Anyone who does rock steady boxing is doing a dual task because you're doing the pattern of the movement while you're doing the movement. That's a mm -hmm. dual task. Interesting. Very, very good for the brain. Okay, we're going to take a, a shift now and talk more about some of the um, coping strategies. So, Doctor, I have actually a poll question I could pop up here that that would allow folks to use uh, a, a manufactured version of this worksheet. Would you like me to throw it up? Please. Great. The Zoom polls allow us to only use multiple choice. So there's I've thrown in a handful of obvious choices that folks can use, but um, this is this is in the category of practicing gratitude and naming two or three things you are grateful for right now. So at the bottom, there's other in case I haven't covered anything that you're grateful for. But I think the model here is that it would be a blank slate and the and folks filling out this worksheet could put whatever they wanted in there. So. Another five seconds and I'll throw up the results so the doctor can see them. Okay, let's see what we got. As we might have expected, friends, family and spouse are very high. But why don't you take it from here, Dr. Katz and explain the basis of that worksheet. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great to see. And it gets, it gets you all really thinking about um, just doing it, doing this practice. So yeah, so basically, uh, as you just did, you kind of looked at looked kind of did a survey of your life and thought about things that you appreciate. That's all gratitude therapy is. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you'd essentially pick two or three things that you appreciate that day. And it really should be specific separate things for the day. So it, it should, it, it doesn't work as well if it's, you know, let's say you have a cute dog and every day you're like, 
and my dog, my dog, my dog, my dog. <laughs> it actually doesn't work as well. This is a graduate therapy is a part of part positive psychology. So the idea is sort of seeing the glass half full and noticing all the positive things. So really you have to think about something that day. So my dog was really cute the way it did this today, right? Or I, the way I took my dog on the walk on a walk today was a beautiful day. So very specific about that day. Um, and then just, just uh, finding a time in the day when you're going to do it. So sometimes uh, you can do it on the dinner table with your family, for example. What did you appreciate today? Two or three things. Or uh, I, for, I like to practice my gratitude therapy when I'm brushing my teeth at night because I'm not doing anything for, for a couple minutes anyway. <laughs> I might as well think of things I appreciated that day. It's just a trigger. It doesn't matter when you do it. Um, so yeah, so if maybe people could think about since, well, it's an early, early today, but maybe yesterday, maybe they can think about and, um, and maybe just even write down in a notebook or just think about, just take a few minutes to think about a few things, specific things that they appreciated um, in their day yesterday. Yeah, journaling is probably a classic example of a tracking tool, right? I mean, if you are yeah. track of anything in your journal, you could keep track of what you're grateful for that day. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, this is this really the next few um, slides are going to be actually things that you can keep in a wellness journal. So any kind of a journal, you can um, kind of just keep a week's worth of pages, seven pages, and you can just write out what your gratitudes are for that day. If you join um, the chaplain that I work with, a course that she has at UCSF, I think she has a, she created this, these, I this the wellness journal that I'm going to be um, showing in the next few slides. And then I think she has like an online version that she does with that course. Um, but you can just take any journal and just start journaling what your appreciations are. There is evidence that writing it down is more effective, actually. Sure. So what happens if you do this for about for a couple of weeks, your brain will automatically start to search for things that it appreciates. Oh, okay? So you don't even have to do anything, the brain will do it. It'll turn, it'll start focusing on different things. So. Okay. And then part of the wellness journal also is just setting a daily intention. And so just writing down, for example, okay, on, on Sunday, my daily intention is on this date, my daily intention is going to be this. Here, I threw one up for them to try out right now. Thank you. <laughs> Give that a vote, folks, and then we'll publish that. Name two or three things you intend to try to accomplish tomorrow. So I gave it a specific date of tomorrow to give them a like concrete that. basis. And that just about does it. Let's see what we got here. Good for them. Good for you folks. Exercise, top of the list. Here, I'll share it. Okay, carry on, Dr. Katz. Oh, exercise really is top of the list. I love it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and so daily intention. So there's different parts. So there's there's goals of the week which is important important part of the of the um wellness journal and in these goals basically and again this was created by our our um, buddhist chaplain um at ucsf that you can all work with on her on her uh free online course that i'll give a link to so uh she really stresses that it's important at the beginning of every week to set up your goals for the rest of the week so your goals for physical health social health mental health and spiritual health. And then she gives in a couple of examples of each. So for example, for your physical health, really specifically, so not, not just, okay, I'm gonna start doing rock steady boxing next week, but really what day, for how long, where is it? <laughs> Write a specific plan about it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so two or three for two or three goals for each of these activities. So two or three activities for each of these goals, sorry. So for the social um, health, you'd write down specifically lunch with a friend when, with who, what, what's really going to happen. Um, mental health, so these are, you know, studying a language or, um, or I mentioned uh, jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, and then for spiritual health, you'd write, want to write down two different things. And, you know, as Todd mentioned, this isn't, this really is, is not, uh, doesn't have to be a, a faith-based specific, you know, organized, uh, you know, place of worship that you are a part of that's, that's wonderful. You know, if that is where you get your spiritual health, but some people get it just by walking on the beach mm -hmm. or by listening to a beautiful piece of music. And so whatever meditating or yoga, and so whatever it is, just sort of have a plan that you can do. Mm -hmm. At the end of the week, you can go back and say, did I meet my goals? Did I do what I needed to do? This is similar to like a running journal that some people runners keep and they can go back and really see. So um, you can even give yourself a little reward because humans, we work on um, reinforcement. <laughs> and, so, and so you can give yourself a little chocolate, you know, <laughs> if you meet your goal and you do everything. So very important to have that reinforcement. And with daily intentions, Certainly you can have it be, you know, I'm going to exercise next week. Another kind of daily intention is more about your theme for the day. Um, and so this is actually, it's a really important part of, um, <clears throat> of, of uh, building resilience. So you might have an, a, daily, a daily intention of calmness, calm, right? Mm -hmm. So during the day, if you, you can kind of just set yourself, that's going to be my goal. My goal is going to be that feeling of calm, being calm. And so when you're feeling kind of upregulated or there's a stressful thing in the day, you can go back to your intention and say, what was my intention? Calmness. Yeah. And you can kind of continue that theme. That orients what you do and your actions and your thoughts for the day. That's good. Do you, would you happen to have these in a hard copy version that you could share with us or are these just digital I, examples? I, yeah, I do. Um, I do have it in a hard copy version. I don't have any, um, I, we had some bound books mm -hmm. uh, when I was at UCSF, but I don't have any of those anymore. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to just give the PDF and then people can print them out. Um, yeah, if you don't mind sending that to me after the fact, that would be terrific. Uh, yeah. They're, they're probably easy enough for folks to do on their own if they have some word skills, but if you've got them in a hard copy version or a digital version that I can share with them, that would be great. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's a three month, the PDF is three months okay. of, of, um, of these weekly goals, uh, intentions, goals, and gratitudes that you can keep. Excellent. And I do suggest doing it with a partner. Just from my own experience, I've been giving them out to people to do. Most people don't do them. <laughs> so, yeah. And so I do think that if you have a partner and that you're um, accountable to, uh, I think that's probably a better, okay, let's take out the books every week. Or did you, you know, practice your intention, even if you just text each other and just let, you know, mm -hmm. let each other know, just finding a partner, I think will keep, keep people sure. more accountable. Doing yeah. it. And I'm seeing in the chat tool that Jodine is talking about uh, an app out there. Have you heard of the app called Today? No. For keeping track of intentions? No, I haven't either. Yeah. But no, it's but in I'll the take a look window. at it during the, the break. I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And then, so I really focus on comprehensive health and I just want to just focus on some of the other aspects of health that um, are really important that may not be stressed um, so much because they're not directly related uh, neurologically. So bone health is really important in Parkinson's. So we know people have balance issues, right? And so if you have balance issues, you can fall and you want to make sure your bones are as healthy as possible. So I recommend people get bone density tests if, if they're in, in the proper age group and making sure that they have the vitamin D level, good vitamin D levels. So bone health is super important. With Parkinson's, uh, blood pressure can actually drop. And so for people who, are, who have had a history of high blood pressure, and then they get Parkinson's, then their, high, then their blood pressure medicines that are meant to control their high blood pressure actually cause them harm because they cause low blood pressure. And so 
I see that a lot. And so it's just something to really keep in mind. So talk to your primary care doctor, or if you have a cardiologist, if you have mm -hmm. Parkinson's, you really need to be on the, on the blood pressure medicines that you're on. Um, dental health is really important. So oral health is really important to our total health. Um, and so it's just not something that is really stressed. In fact, dental health is not taught at all in medical school. It's almost like not important to our health, but it is. So I really am, you know, just, it's, it's actually really important. We're, we're learning more and more that it's important for, for longevity um, <clears throat> to have good dental health. The bacteria actually in the mouth can cause pneumonia. So mm. that's, that's primarily why. So it's, it's important to have good dental health. Um, annual dermatology evaluation, there is an increased risk of skin cancer in people with Parkinson's. So it's a small increased risk, but it is a risk and really everyone should be getting annual dermatology evaluations and skin checks. So, mm -hmm. and sleep quality is super, super important. Um, so we really, most people need seven to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep at night. We know Parkinson's disrupts sleep. Um, mood, mood disorders can disrupt sleep. So it's really, really important to um, be able to uh, access whatever is needed to help you sleep well. Um, Headspace, the Headspace app has some really good meditations to help people go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who wakes up a lot at night, you can do one of their meditations on how to reduce mental chatter <laughs> and help yourself go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's non-pharmacologic ways to help you go back to sleep. It's not just about the drugs. There's a special cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia that your doctor can refer you to that is more effective than any of the drugs. Hmm. And it helps you have a good behave, like it, it basically helps you have a good, um, good sleep, good sleep hygiene. So what are your behaviors around sleep? And then vascular risk factors are really important. We know, for example, people with high cholesterol, high blood pressure and diabetes progress faster. So heart health, brain health. Right. Yeah, this this slide really sure highlights the whole team orientation around palliative and holistic care, doesn't it? I mean, I've got my own questions on that later, but um, this really encapsulates it all into one slide quite nicely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. So that saying is really true. Yeah. All right. So and then just the, my last few slides are just about how to make the most out of your doctor's visits. And, um, and just keeping in mind that most doctors are not trained in the palliative care, total health perspective. Uh, we're really just trained to see people as biological buttons. <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's the Western medical training. Right. And so while, while palliative care cha is challenging that um, and is, is being integrated slowly into, the, into medical training, we're still, we're still very much, um, in the biological buttons world. So it's really important for you all to know that and that you're actually kind of, you know, you, you, these ideas a lot of the times will need to come from the patients and from the families. Um, so you wanna share what's important with your doctor, um, what brings your life meaning, um, what, what, is a, what, what does a life worth living mean to you, basically? What are your goals and values? Maybe it's going to a wedding and um, you know, being able to really confidently say a speech at, at, at a family, you know, at, a, at a child's wedding, right? So that's important for your doctor to know that that's a goal so that we can really focus on you know, helping with speech therapy or helping you know, um, with voice projection, those types of things. Um, and so you know, it's just important to know maybe your family, maybe they're planning a wedding. There's an important wedding that you're hoping to you know, be able to travel to. And so being really you know, able to focus on that as a goal, super important. And letting your doctor know about your adjustment reaction, if you have one. You know, do you have concerns or fears about the future? Are you struggling with um, an adjustment reaction or reactive depression? And so that's really important to let people know. I like this slide and the previous slide. So I thought I'd throw up a poll question for folks to see what, that, what kind of care they're getting from their doctors and what kind of information they're sharing with their doctors. So folks, if you have a chance to answer that quick poll, that'd be great.
And then when we get to your last slide, doctor, I'll throw up one or two other final poll questions just to get a sort of wrap up for folks with how confident they are in their own palliative care support system. Okay, I'll close that one and publish it for you. That's good. Seems like they're asking questions and trying to get help from their doctor. I mean, that's the obvious first step, right? But sharing concerns with your doctor and sharing your goals and values are sort of a distant second and third. Yeah, yeah. And I find that when people share um, emotions, difficult emotions related to the adjustment reaction, that they're often labeled as being depressed or that that's a pathological emotion. You know, if you're if you know if when sometimes when people say you know things things are hard because i miss not being able to do um skiing or other types of activities for example mm -hmm. um that that doesn't get addressed appropriately as um, something that needs a coping strategy and how how do you um help someone with that and so i think that people often don't share that with with their clinicians because they're worried about having sort of their normal normal um emotions kind of made into like a pathology, which it's not. And so I, I'm not sure if that's really what people are sort of going through that whole thing that might just be sort of underlying things, but, um, and, and it's probably also because doctors aren't asking. Right. Um, and so I encourage you to, you know, to ask about it and, and to talk about it and to, um, you know, and, it, and, and to be honest, it's, it's, it's a learning curve for, for, people in the medical profession as well to really integrate these <clears throat> of palliative care. And so I'm gonna be giving you, um, you know, a lot of the resources that are available to help right. with these difficult emotions and with anticipatory guidance and, and just being able to, you know, acknowledge any concerns about the future and also being, being able to address them in a proactive way. Good. That President. Well, you're about to wrap up here. So let me lob up these last two quick poll questions. The first one is targeted toward just folks with Parkinson's. Now that you understand what palliative care is better, what do you feel is missing from your current care structure? You can select as many of those as apply. And then we'll ask virtually the same question of care providers, caregivers in a second here. I think this is very enlightening that the, the, the fact that palliative care really means a team-based approach at a much broader set of symptoms as, 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 as it were, not just physical or mental symptoms, but other, other ancillary touch points like family and spiritual health. And I mean, the obvious ones to, to most of us that come through first are physical health and medicine and then emotional and mental health and you know solving for anxiety and depression you don't really expand we haven't i haven't really expanded my window for example into the spiritual side of things and so this is interesting so here the poll is survey says that which is missing most from folks sort of holistic diet is psychological and spiritual healing like i just said Okay, yeah. let me take a second and throw up real quick the last one and then I'll let you wrap up and we'll take a bio break. Mm -hmm. So PD caregivers and care partners, tell us what you think areas of your care could be improved upon now that you know more about palliative care. And by the way, this is the group that probably knows most about palliative care among our audience. So I'm not sure how many caregivers we've got online with us right now, but we shall see in a minute here. Oh, there's quite a few chiming in. That's great. Okay, I'm going to make this quick. I'm sorry, everybody. If you haven't had a chance to vote, that's okay. We'll move on to our bio break in a minute. So caregivers out there are in the same boat. They feel like if there's anything that they could be improving their their care structure around it's it's around psychological and spiritual healing. It's indicative, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, well, we'll let you wrap up, and and then we'll take a break. Yeah, thank you. 
And I think it's interesting, Todd, when you said that it's not something that you've really incorporated or kind of thought of as a part of your important to health. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, existential distress, no one's immune to it, right? It's a part of the human condition and it's what what everyone will face when they have a life-changing diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's something that that everyone suffers with, but it's not something that we know um, that we really acknowledge and, and, and recognize as a part, as a, as in, that we are struggling with it and mm-hmm. that it's a natural part of our struggle when we're dealing with something serious. And so, um, and so I, that was really enlightening as well um, that, you know, it's not, it's not just from the clinician side that we're not recognizing it. I think it, you know, it's also from people who are affected mm-hmm. by, um, by Parkinson's or by, you know, anything related to mm-hmm. that, that also you're not seeing it as an aspect of your health either. And so I think right. the, there's education that needs to go both ways. Mm-hmm. We see ourselves kind of as, you know, Dr. Cicely Saunders, she talked about, you know, that, that without that, we're really shortchanging us as humans. And I think that's a good perspective to have. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, you I'll know. say that's good um so these are questions about kind of for the for the uh care partners about you know feeling overwhelmed or do you need support at home the number one most important thing to reduce caregiver care partner burnout is regular respite regular breaks Mm. we all need our own oxygen first so that's the number one important things and i can't tell you how many care partners i tell that to and they say i'm not worried about that (laughs) It's like first responders in any emergency, life. right? If you're, yeah. if you're if you're not healthy enough to take care of yourself, then how can you take care of somebody else? Right, right, right. And so you have to remember, even SEAL Team Six caregiver needs to recharge. Yeah. <laughs> There's some tough people out there; even they need to recharge. So yeah. So conclusions: total health includes your physical, emotional, social, and spiritual health. We cannot be healthy without all of these aspects being addressed. Connection is protection. We were not meant to be isolated. Wellness builds resilience. You, there are strategies you can have that you can learn to build your resilience that you can practice today. And remember that it's not about, resilience is not about how you endure. It's about how you thrive. Great, excellent. Okay. All right, should we take a very brief break? We'll make it short. We don't want to lose folks' attention, and and we've got a lot of questions. I think. And by the way, I should have mentioned earlier, you can start lobbing those questions into the to the Q and A tool. I see two questions are in already from Marta. Great. Stay. Keep keep plugging those in, folks. Uh, while we take literally a two or a three minute break, not not any longer, um, and we'll be back to. I've got my own long list of questions, and so. <laughs> When we come back, we'll start with Marta's and mine, and we'll uh, hopefully others can chime in as well. So, I need ten minutes or ten minutes. I'd say I'd say even less if that's okay. Five minutes, all right? Yeah, it's fine. All right. Go no, rapid fire, Just fire right, break good. fast. Okay. All right, I'll put myself on mute, but we'll we'll uh, everybody stay connected if you don't mind. Uh, it'll it'll save you some trouble coming back online again. See you in five minutes.
Should I keep sharing? I think it's fine to, you know, take you the sharing off at this point. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And we're back. I'm thrilled to see we've had very few, if any, drop offs. Still got over 50 attendees. Thank you, folks, for bearing with us. And I hope you had a good little banana break or whatever you did. That's what I did. So we do have a few questions coming in. <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm going to start with one of my own, selfishly, but then we're also going to pick off some of the ones in the Q&A form here. So I'll start with this one, Dr. Katz. I understand that one of the goals of palliative care is to relieve suffering and provide the best possible quality of life for patients and their families. So tell us a little bit more about the family aspect. For example, what disciplines are brought into play to help families cope with diseases like PD? Yeah, so most of the coping strategies, the resiliency strategies really focus are typically taught by the chaplain. And so I'm, I put in the link for um, people with Parkinson's. And so you can see the different uh, skills that she teaches every uh, week. And then I'll, I'll share, I'll share um, the link for people with, um, for caregiving, for uh -huh. people who are care partners. Great. Um, and I think that one is actually starting on September. The new course is starting on September 14th as well. Oh, great. Um, and so she teaches uh, balance and grounding, positive intention setting, uh, repertoire of stress responses, meeting difficult emotions, mindful self-compassion. Mm. Um, she is the chaplain you're talking about at UCSF. Yeah, the chaplain. Great. Yeah. So these are in palliative care, the coping and resiliency is taught by the chaplain. Um, mm -hmm. that's, is that delivered virtually? This is, yeah, this course is delivered virtually. Mm -hmm. Great. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. And so, and, and really um, just being able to uh, highlight the importance that care partners need to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So caring for the care partner is really important. And that regular respite is really, really important. Yeah. Um, there are really serious health consequences to care partners that get burned out. We can actually see, see changes in DNA. And in, 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 in care partners that are burnt out, it affects life expectancy. It's very Good. serious. And so okay. um, even the you know toughest, most stoic care partner who you know, tells me they don't need respite. Yeah. <laughs> they may not know it, they just need I plant it. the seed. I'm like, well, <laughs> 
Where, I mean, it's, you know, and, it's okay, and it's okay to admit that, right? I mean, the, and it's okay to admit part that. Of, part of the secret here is that, it, you know, you may think you're being strong in the face of, of difficult times, and but you may not be your best treatment self. You may not be your best helpful self. So yeah, the suck it up mentality can only go so far. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is a, a big a big part of the training. I worked at the VA. I worked at, with veterans for. Um, 10 years and mm -hmm. there was a poster at the VA that says it takes the courage of a warrior to ask for help. And yeah. I'll, I'll always forget that. I'll, I'll never forget that poster because it's so powerful. Um, you know, you're talking to soldiers who can't ask for help, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, for, uh, it really takes the courage. It, it takes a lot of courage to ask for help. So, yeah. um, so yeah. Actually, I, I'm gonna follow up with a question uh, following Todd's lead, a personal one. Um, I've gone from being the, um, the patient to the caregiver in a relatively short period of time. Um, I'm finding the role of caregiver to be much more stressful than my own Parkinson's diagnosis. Do you have any suggestions on um, how to deal with, you know, what, what you take care of and how do you prioritize? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, really, it's a really kind of double difficult situation. Right, because you're taking this, taking on the stress of both roles, mm -hmm. and so that might be why you know I think being a care partner is incredibly difficult, and for you, you have the stress of both roles, so it is it is going to be more stressful, more difficult. I think that it's really um, important for to make sure that you have respite, regularly scheduled respite, so a half you know during the week, what are your days that you can take care of yourself. You know, you need like a, at least a half a day a week, if not, you know, a few, you know, more breaks during the week as well. It's really important that you plan like an overnight vacation, <laughs> a real respite, a real break. If you could take a week off, wonderful. The, you know, the, just, just being able to plan that. And then there's mini respites that um, that you'll learn about in the, in the online course if you take it with the chaplain, Judy. Um, and so basically mini respites are, um, you can, you know, for example, just having a cup of coffee in the morning and that's your time. <laughs> just focus on yourself, center yourself, build your intentions for the day. You know, little uh, mini mindful moments throughout the day. Um, for example, uh, one of the, uh, I can just give a quick teaching of uh, just a quick mini mindful moment that you can take. It's called a grace breath. So um, I can go. I can go over it with you now. Um, it's a it's a it's a powerful technique that um, it just automatically triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. So it takes down the stress. You don't have to even do anything. You can just uh, you don't have to think anything. You can just do the practice. So if you just bring your legs uh, centered on the ground, kind of get a comfortable position that you're sitting in. Bring your hands in your lap in a comfortable place where they'll just hang out for a while. Just close your eyes and take a breath in through your nose and feel the air going through your nose. Just feel the air. That's all you're doing is centering your attention on that feeling. Okay, did everyone feel that? Sorry, I'm not seeing people, but okay. Next time, take a breath in, feel the air going through your nose on your out breath, change your attention to focus on the support of the chair and the support of the floor. You can rest in that attention and you don't need to take another breath. You can just rest in the quiet space between breaths. Your body will know when to take another breath. You can just rest in that quiet. And that's it. It's called a grace breath. It's really simple. <laughs> That was very helpful. Now, uh, I guess we should go on to some of the uh, other questions coming from the audience. I do. I want to, I actually really wanted to teach the grace breath. So what I'll tell you about the grace breath, and this is what I learned from our chaplain, is that you have to practice it when you're calm in mm. order to access it when you're not calm, right? Mm. So you practice it every day, a few times a day. I practice my grace breath, for example, when I eat meals, because that's three times a day, right? So you can just have a practice. Our chaplain practices when she goes to the bathroom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's that's a form of respite, I guess. 
<laughs> doesn't matter what your trigger is. Just have a trigger so that you have a practice. Then you can get to it when you're when you're stressed. Yeah, good. Okay, so Marta has a good question and it, it, it jives with one of mine, but we'll give her credit. Uh, so refreshing to hear about total wellness. Where can we find this approach in the Bay Area, both for PD and any other health support? Um, and I will start by chiming in and say that some of my research prior to this webinar, I found a um, palliative care provider directory that Adam pasted the link into the chat group on earlier. I'll do it again in a minute here. Um, that looks interesting where you to put in your zip code and, and it gives you some listings of different um, organizations and care providers that offer palliative care. So a two part question then, other than her part, I'm curious, does a care provider need to be sort of certified in any sense of the term to be a palliative care provider? That's a good question. Um, at this point, no, because it's mm -hmm. such a new field. People are kind mm -hmm. of grandfathered in. There is a palliative care specialty for doctors that they have to complete a fellowship and, mm -hmm. and there's a, a board exam that they complete. Okay. Um, so certainly for, for physicians that are palliative care specialists and social workers get extra training to be palliative care specialists. Nurses get extra training if they want to be on a palliative care team. So yes, but in general, there's sort of this idea within palliative care is there aren't enough palliative care teams to take care of everyone dealing with something serious. It's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so really any doctor, any nurse, anyone who takes care of some of people that are dealing with something serious need basic primary palliative care skills. So really what, what I'm trying to do, and we just completed a <clears throat> clinical trial is training people how to be primary palliative care providers so that, that they can give this the uh, basic kind of primary level and mm -hmm. then you can go to a specialty team if you need it. Train the trainer as it were. Train the trainer. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, um, here's one from Jay Kringle um, about under California's uh, Death with Dignity Act, um, a doctor must judge a person has at least six months to live uh, to qualify for medically assisted suicide. Um, but people um, would really qualify. What do you think is appropriate or should public policy efforts address this? That's a really, really important, um, big and heavy question. And, um, and I think really is on the minds of a lot of people, whether um, they have a serious illness diagnosis or whether they have a family member or whether they're just a human being that understands that life is fragile. Um, and I mean, I have my own personal um, kind of philosophy about it that I think people should be able to define what's an acceptable quality of life for themselves. And that as a physician, I part of my role is to help um, them have live as well as they can for as long as they can live well. Um, and then I can, you know, we're, we're all, none of us can avoid taxes or, you know, <laughs> You know, we're, we're all going in one direction, right? So um, in Buddhism, they say a person living is a person dying, right? And so that is a really profound and um, challenging concept to kind of wrap your mind around and then is very true, right? And so physicians in the medical field, needs, we need to get our heads out of the sand. We need to recognize what people are really going through and that living and dying are natural parts of life and we can't just avoid them by sticking our heads in the sand, we need to face them. And so I think that we give people a disservice when we put on these really false, um, um, I guess, uh, uh, boundaries to how we can really help people live as well as they can and um, for as long as they can. And really, you know, I think that we can help people at, towards, you know, in the, in the last kind of leg of life, in the last journey of life. Um, live well to the very end also. And that I think, you know, is really the goal. So I, I think the six month limit is, is, is really absurd. But I think that we need to start somewhere. <clears throat> and this is what passed. Yeah, I'll remind folks that we had an interesting roundtable, PD Active sponsored roundtable discussion back in February, I think it was on end of life questions and concerns um, as sort of presented to us by some of our own community members. It was very helpful. That is up on the YouTube channel for PDA, uh, which was pasted into the chat tool a while ago. Um, 
question from another one of our attendees, Dr. Katz. Where do you think is the line between being a caretaker and allowing PD patients to still have some autonomy? Yeah, I think that's a really, really important question. As much autonomy as possible is usually really important for people. Autonomy is one of the critical aspects of spiritual health for a lot of people. When I ask people what are their important values, what are the things that they're worried about losing the most, it's usually autonomy. Mm. And um, people really feel less than themselves, usually, yeah. if they don't yeah. have that. Um, <clears throat> And so I think the more, the more autonomy you can give people, the better, the better. Of, of course, you have to make sure that there's a safe environment if, you sure. know, the medication schedules for people with Parkinson's can be, you know, extremely complex. And so you really need um, a care partner to help with that. It's mm -hmm. not, might, might not be safe to just, you know, give a pile of medications and like mm -hmm. a, a pill box, right? So to try to organize. So a lot of people need help with that. So you have to, you know, keep that in mind, but autonomy is really important for spiritual health. I'm sure. And it's probably goes without saying, or it falls in the obvious category, but the degree of autonomy that we want as a caregiver to grant our patients depends also largely on the severity of their, or the degree of their illness and their symptoms. So oh, if, they've got a, if they've got mild symptoms, then a walk in the park alone might be okay. But if they're more advanced then that's, then autonomy takes on a different color. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think a lot of what we do in palliative care is say, you know, maybe you're not, maybe, uh, you know, if, if these were the activities that you love doing that you still want to do, it's not like you have to give them up. Mm -hmm. But let's change, let, let's, we, we just need to modify them so that you're safe and you still have this, the autonomy of doing it. So maybe mm -hmm. it's, you know, walking with someone else, but it's mm -hmm. not like a, you know, an all or none kind of situation. I'm a big fan of harm reduction, right? So, I mean, listen, we all cross the street, right? We put our lives at risk. It's probably the most dangerous thing we do. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know. If, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I was going too long on that answer. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Um, Dr. Katz, maybe you could talk about uh, dealing with dementia as, as well as Parkinson's. Um, how can family help with this? What are coping strategies to take on this additional challenge? Yeah, yeah. Dementia is a really scary word for people and um, it's a big D word. It's um, a difficult word for people to process, especially if they're, if they have dementia, I think it's a, it's, um, there's, of course, just difficulty accepting um, that situation. I just want to kind of, what does dementia mean? Dementia means the cognitive impairment is to a point where people can't live independently. That's what it means. So just sort of taking the stigma away from that word a little bit. Um, so I think that it's really important for people to get help. Care partners need help. It's not, nobody does this alone. So it's really important to get, um, if there's caregiving help that you can get in regularly so that you can, um, so people don't lose the forest through the trees. Like you can see the big perspective, what really needs to be done. And there's a lot of, you know, if there's burnout, um, that just, you know, is a really high risk area for burnout. So I can't stress that enough. Um, really making sure that care partners have the, you know, if they need to uh, work with a therapist to really help um, or with a chaplain to really help make sure that they're um, thriving as much as they can, you know, within, you know, within that difficult situation. Um, and then I think that there is anticipatory uh, grief that happens. You know, when there's someone who, uh, a loved one who is uh, facing dementia and a care partner experiencing that as well, there's real loss. There's, there's a lot of loss, you know, of the, of the person and of the relationship that often really needs the help of a therapist to really process that. It's impossible without that kind of help. Really, be, really being honest with yourself about the difficulty of the situation um, and reaching out for help is really, really important. In terms of the specific, you know, if there's specific behavioral issues, um, there's uh, there's 
different tricks basically that we use to just kind of help redirect people. Um, it's really important that not to argue with people that, you know, if they have, you know, cognitive impairment and they're um, not necessarily, you know, doing the kind of typical things that they would do, or if they're saying things that aren't necessarily rational, it's not really helpful to argue, right? You can just say, okay, that the important thing is to acknowledge and pivot. So, okay, and how about this? <laughs> so acknowledge, pivot. <laughs> Using the word okay is really good acknowledgement, but you're kind of closing the conversation while you're acknowledging it. <laughs> and then so, pivoting quickly. Sorry? And then pivoting quickly. And then that. you pivot, right. So there's different tricks that you can learn in dealing, you know, helping people with cognitive impairment that, you know, you can work with a neuro, your doctor can send, um, can help you work with a neuropsychologist. Usually they're really the best or social workers that work with that population. So there's two separate things. There's the coping and resiliency and the anticipatory grief that is unavoidable, right? And so if you just kind of bury it and you don't acknowledge it, you're not, you're, in, at the, at the long, in the long run, it's going to hit you, right? We can't, we can't avoid it. We can't suck, we can't suck everything up. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the actual kind of knowledge and how to just manage the situation. So there's two separate things. Mm -hmm. Good. So a question I have um, is if we are locked into a care provider and we feel like we're not getting palliative or team-based care, I won't tell you who they are, but their initials are KP. Then what can we do about that? <laughs> <laughs> so we've probably got a lot of Kaiser patients uh, members on the on the call. Oh, so. Kaiser, got it, got it. Okay, yeah. No, interestingly, Kaiser actually has a good palliative care program. Do they? So you can, they do, they do, and they have a lot of good movement disorder specialists. The problem is they don't tell everyone about it, and hmm. I don't know why. Um, I think they don't tell everyone about the movement disorder specialist because there's just not enough of them, but you can ask your general neurologist to refer you to a movement disorder specialist. They will be better at taking care of the many aspects of, you know, of, of life that Parkinson's affects. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to have that holistic perspective because again, medical training is about biological buttons. Um, but you can then, you can also ask your doctor to refer you to palliative care. And they really, they do have a strong palliative care program that is a general palliative care at-, at, at so, so we should ask for palliative care specifically as opposed to a movement disorder specialist or both? Uh, yeah, if you're not seeing a movement disorder specialist, you should be. Yeah. And, um, you know, even if it's just, you know, uh, twi twice a year by telemedicine, mm -hmm. if, you're li if you live far away, you really need the movement disorder specialist. We know people do better with a specialist. Yeah. Well, you're right about the supply because I did ask my neurologist at Kaiser last year to put me in touch with a movement disorder specialist and um, he tried to make a referral, but the Dr. Lee was so busy that I, I haven't been able to get in to see him virtually or in person. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See if I can keep knocking on that door. Yeah, um, or you can just enroll from Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually with Kaiser and, you know, dealing with a uh, caretaker and, um, and patient. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that I'm getting tremendous support right now um, between co coordination of um, social worker and physical therapy and uh, OT, um, speech therapy, um, uh, therapy. They're kind of really working together. Um, you know, my, situ or my husband's situation is changing rapidly, declining rapidly. And they have been terrific. And I also highly recommend Dr. Rima Ash in San Francisco. Yeah, it's yeah. the drive to get there, but she is fabulous. He is really fabulous. And um, I'm gonna kick, I'm gonna <laughs> like shoot myself in the foot. But you know, for those of you who want to go, I was just thinking about Dr. Ash. So I'm glad that you highlighted her. She really is fantastic. Um, there's also a really good uh, movement source specialist with Kaiser and um, San Rafael, Dr. Nandi Potty. So. For those of you who want to switch, you can reach out to me. Um, I'm not sure what the best way is, and I can maybe just ask Dr. Ash and Dr. Nandipati, who I know, um, to see if they can take on some extra patients. I think it is really important to see the specialist. Yeah. And you can ask for a palliative care referral at Kaiser. They actually do have one of the most robust programs. Well, that's really good to know. I feel like I've been sort of left out in the dark on that. So I hear that a lot with Kaiser, and I'm not sure why the general neurologists really like hang on. <laughs> 
Dr. Rima uh, Nima Patti. Nandipati. Right? Nandipati. Is she also Kaiser? She's at Kaiser in San Rafael. Okay. And M she's an MDS? Yeah. Yeah. So you can, I'm not sure what the best way is, but if you send, if I somehow get your name and contact through this, then I'm happy to um, reach out to them and, and ask them to. Well, that's nice. Okay. I'm gonna put... Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of it, and so there are, for example, Sutter. Sutter has some really good palliative care programs now that are general. Palliative care really came from the oncology world. And so most palliative care programs are really, they only know oncology. They don't know neurology at all. So you really, you know, you don't want to go to someone who doesn't know anything about what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. but a lot of the, there are more palliative care programs becoming general. So Sutter has some access to that. Um, so you can ask if you have, if you're in the Sutter program, you know, is there a palliative care program that, that can, that I can be a part of? Um, and then I, and then I, I have started a neuro palliative care wellness program at Stanford. We just got it started. And so I'm minimally funded. <laughs> That's what I would say. I just started there this year. I don't have a whole team. It's me and a nurse mm -hmm. uh, right now. So I'm building my whole team. I'm hoping in the next year or so to have the full team. We're just operating a few, uh, just a few hours, um, half a day a month. We're just building, but I'm hoping in the next three to six months to have a much larger program to be able to see people. That's great. That's exciting. Good for you. UCSF also has a general palliative care clinic. You can ask your doctor to refer you to that has the whole team. Mm -hmm. So there are, um, there, there's, there, there are available resources there. And I encourage you to join the, the online caregiver and, um, uh, you know, resiliency programs and, and um, patient resiliency programs. Great, excellent. Um, a question comes in from Michelle, who's interested in a course for um, people with Parkinson's, not just for the care, care provider. Uh, anything specific that you could mention? Yeah, so actually the two courses that I, um, so the first course is uh, for people with Parkinson's that I gave the link to. That's a six week online skill build building course. And it's just with any, it's gonna be with anyone dealing with anything serious neurologically. So Parkinson's related, anything else. Um, and then the second course that I put the link for is for care partners. Ah, uh, let's see if I've messed up those links then. First one is, eventbrite.com. Are they both Eventbrite events? They're both Eventbrite's events. One is resiliency for people with serious illness and the other is sustainable caregiving. Ah, good, okay. So that's spelled out in the URL, folks. If you're looking at the, the chat bar, you'll see that one is with serious illness. The other one is partners of people with serious illness. Good, okay. I won't bother to fix that for at the risk of further complicating it. Um, and one of our members asks, who is the chaplain? What is the chaplain's name again? Her name is, I'll put it in the, um, the chaplain is Judy Long. Okay, great. So I'll put, I'll put that in there. Um, another question that's come in is, does palliative care include a notion of minimizing suffering? It seems that um, many or most normal doctors seem concerned only with maximizing length of life. Um, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, palliative care is 100% focused on minimizing suffering. That is the entire goal of palliative mm -hmm. care. And not only minimizing physical suffering, but the social, psychological, and spiritual suffering. And there's also another aspect of um, just practical suffering that happens. So how do I you know, coordinate this or get that that really becomes a huge nightmare for people can be right if you don't know where to go and you're kind of stuck in the, the healthcare maze. <laughs> so that's sort of the practical suffering that, that we also address. Mm -hmm. um, we've really, the goal of palliative care is really to be an extra layer of support to help with the stress of being sick. That's a general definition of palliative care. And so that's different for every person. But it's really, it's really comprehensive. There's really nothing excluded from that. <laughs> it's a very comprehensive care. So, 
Okay, I've got another question here. We're, we're coming close to the end of our questions as they appear in the Q&A tool anyway. So uh, if folks have any others, feel free to lob them in. Otherwise we'll approach a wrap up here. But uh, my friend Herb asks uh, a bit of a philosophical question, but I'll, I'll read it out verbatim. It seems obvious that our healthcare system isn't working very well. A palliative approach seems like a good way to go, but doctors are always pressed for time. Are there things we can do to make our broken system work better for us and each other? Oh, that's such a great question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in general, you have a lot of power. You may not know that, but you have a lot of power to change the system. So, um, you know, because it is a, these, these healthcare companies, they're businesses, right? So they're not profits, but they're still, they still have to bring in, right? So they want, they need to bring people in, right? To sustain mm -hmm. themselves. So um, really, you know, if I make a statement, a complaint about the system, it's not really taken too far. But if a patient or a care partner calls the patient advocate mm. um, and says, you know what, I can't get through the um, clinic line. I'm on hold for like 30 minutes every time. That's going to make a lot more impact. Mm -hmm. In every healthcare setting, there's a patient advocate. And that's the way to get things changed. Great. So if that's you want good. to say, hey, we're not getting enough of this. I'm not feeling my, my needs heard. It has to go through the patient advocate. That's the trick. Good to know. I'm putting that into the chat window for folks. Um, another question. What is your advice for a family member who's resistant to change in DBS setting, setting changes and also in denial of disease, which is hard to be open to preventative measures and self-care? So mm, someone is mm. in denial, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So the palliative care perspective of denial is really um, that that person is, um, is grieving. And they haven't, you know, there's the stages of acceptance, right? And they're not, they're not so neat, right? People don't like go through, okay, anger and I'm done with anger. <laughs> now I'm just gonna go into bargaining. Oh, okay, now I'm done. They go, it's all jumbled in between, you know? And, and then at some point, most people do reach acceptance. But denial is really just a state of grieving. It's the bargaining stage. So trying to convince someone, they're not asking you for more facts. No, I'm gonna convince you that you really need this and that you do have this illness and that you do need to do this. That's not gonna go anywhere. They're asking you for emotional connection at that time. So it's really just about being there, being present with the person, acknowledging that absolutely, this is hard to accept. And everyone's gonna have their own time to reach acceptance. There's no way to you know, make that faster. And um, yeah, so. Well, then there's a good follow-up here by Linda. If I do not want to deteriorate with Parkinson's, when am I eligible to ask for end-of-life medication? Now this opens up a whole nother topic for conversation. And we talked about that a little bit in our February roundtable. So uh, again, please refer back to the YouTube channel, but if you have a, a short response to that kind of deep question. Yeah, we'll yeah, of course. Yeah, I think that, you know, we should all think about what, what makes our life worth living? What is an acceptable quality of life for each of us? And that is going to be different for every single person. For example, my husband, he loves video games and he literally told me he could be connected to thousands of machines. As long as he could play video games with virtual reality, he would be happy as a clam. <laughs> <laughs> That's like literally my torture. <laughs> I'd be like, I hate video games. <laughs> but we, so but we have to do what we can do for our loved ones, right? Oh my God. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'll do that for him, but I mean, um, so it is every single person has a different definition of what is acceptable for them. There's so much that we can do in healthcare, right? Our, we need to give people the kind of care that they want and not the kind of healthcare that they don't want. Mm -hmm. And so I think <clears throat> stepping back, that's a really important question. We are limited by the law is the law. Right. So re regardless of that, I'm philosophically opposed to the law, it is the law. Right. So um, the six months is the law right now. But what I would really kind of take a step back to the bigger kind of question within that question is really that we need to think about what's an acceptable quality of life. We need to talk to our loved ones about what that acceptable quality of life means. Mm -hmm. um, and then we need to document it. So that our wishes are carried out. 
and share that with our family, of course, and with our doctor, with our doctors. Our GP. So that, yeah, so that our wishes are carried out. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, just finding a physician that, you know, has that palliative care kind of quality of life perspective as well mm -hmm. um, is, is important um, so that they can honor your wishes. Mm -hmm. Sue, I'm going to chime in with one other follow-up question. Herb has a follow-up question on his old question, where your answer was, find your uh, patient advocate. How, Herb asks, how can we find our patient advocate? And I'm sure that varies from pro provider to provider, but is there a foolproof way of getting in touch with, I mean, you call the 800 you number? Just Google. Google. just Google it. Okay. Yeah, there's a patient advocate for Stanford. There's a patient advocate for Kaiser, UCSF. Mm -hmm. Sutter. I mean, like this, you know, if you're in like a small um, mom and pop kind of group, they're not going to have a patient advocate. But, um, but if you're if you're in any kind of a larger system, they're going to have a patient advocate. Okay. And they're the ones that medical providers for some. I mean, we jump for patient advocates. I don't know why, but they're the ones that make the difference. Is that right? So oh, they yeah. really they really carry some sway. Oh yeah. Huh. Oh yeah. People jump yeah. when they call. So. Oh, that's good to know. There you go, Herb. Uh, a quick, uh, quick one. I know we're getting close on time. Is um, UCF, UCSF online course free, or do you, does insurance cover it? It's free. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I'm gonna, Dr. Katz. It looks like some of your entries into the chat window are just going to the panelists, so I'm just copying them over to the full attendees, so folks can see what you're typing in there. Um, are there many more questions? I have one other question and it may be our last. One of your slides speaks nicely about communicating with our doctors, with our care providers. Um, one of the things that we don't want to communicate is our, are our goals. What are some examples of, if I'm a PW, if I'm a person with Parkinson's, what are, what are some example of goals that I might communicate to my doctor? Yeah, for example, I had a patient that asked me, um, after getting diagnosed after a few years saying, you know, I've always wanted to build a dream home. Yep. Oh, okay. And should I do it? Am I going to be able to do it? Am I going to be able to enjoy it? Right. Interesting. Super important question. The answer was yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you should build it. And yes, you will enjoy it. <laughs> quick. <laughs> Hurry. No, not quick. Not <laughs> quick. You know, a lot of the times people think things are worse than they are. Right? <clears throat> so you know, we, so asking, I think really, you know, being able to say, okay, this is what I would like to do. And is this reasonable given that I have this diagnosis and, and for a lot of people, the news is much better than they think it is. Mm. Good. So, I can so yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Sue, so are you seeing any other questions that we've skipped over or? Um, I think we're good. Uh, just a comment from her, Herb about um, what, definition of what I want it does change over time. And I, I, I can understand that. And I don't know, uh, Dr. Katz has any comments on it? Absolutely. It's an ongoing conversation, mm -hmm. right? So it's okay. not a one-time conversation, one and done, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing conversation that you can have with your family and an ongoing conversation that you should have with the team that is, you know, guy, helping to guide the, your ship, mm -hmm. right? so that you can have a good quality of life. So it absolutely changes with time. There's no doubt about that. And so that's why it's just, it's an ongoing conversation. It's kind of like, you know, a, a shirt you have to try on every year to make sure it, make sure it still fits. <laughs> that's yeah, how that's one cool. of the kind of leaders of the movement in palliative care and Parkinson's talks about it. So. Mm -hmm. Great, all right. I am seeing no other questions come in. So I think we should wrap. Sue, does that sound okay to you? Sounds like a good plan. Dr. Katz, what an important topic. I mean, palliative care uh, is, is so much more meaningful to me now, thanks to your definition and for your guidance on it. So um, speaking for all of our attendees and PD Active and Sue, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah. Uh, I know weekends are precious for doctors. And so we thank you for carving out two big hours of your precious weekend for us. Oh, yeah. um, you and I might stay in touch a little bit by email afterwards in case there's follow-up links or maybe the digital versions of the worksheets that we talked about. Yeah, I'm gonna, can, should I just send that to you and then you'll send it out? Yeah, if you don't mind, that would be terrific. Oh, and yeah. I'll send it out to the attendees and probably the whole PD Active community. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Give it a try too. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Hugely yeah. appreciated. I hope you have a nice rest of your weekend. Absolutely. You all Take as care. well. Take and care. And goodbye, everyone. Thanks for joining. We will be in touch about follow-up um, on posting this to YouTube, as well as any other digital documents we can share with you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye now. Ciao.